I want you to hit me as hard as you can. Some say that if he didn't make it in show business, he would have turned to the mafia. Others say he's a talented musician who accidentally became a movie star. And all the rest just consider Mr. Joe Pesci to be the most reliable supporting character actor of all time. Joe Pesci is a 5 foot 3 inch ball of fury who could explode at any second. And you have no idea if it will be terrifying or hilarious. But whatever happens, you know it will be great. And I know that everybody is afraid to tell Joe Pesci that he's funny, but in fact he does have a sense of humor about his on-screen persona, especially if they pay him in Snickers. What are you doing? A girl's totally into me. Brad, eat a Snickers. Why? Because you get a little angry when you're hungry. Better? Better. Every film, every performance is truly unforgettable. But lately, in the past few decades, it feels like we've been seeing less and less of Mr. Joe Pesci. Which leads me to a few questions. Questions like, Where the f*** you go, Joe? You fucking gone f***ing fishing or something? Like, like what the f*** happened to you? You get too f***ing old or something? What the f***? Like, what the f*** happened to Joe Pesci? And we mean that in the most respectful way possible. What the f***? Thank you very much for watching. Please like, share, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified every time a new video is posted. Now, back to the show. But to truly understand what the f happened to Joe Pesci, we must start at the beginning of the beginning began when he was born on his birthday. 1943, New Jersey. He was a child actor. And by 10 years old, Joe Pesci was a regular on the variety show, Star Time Kids. To get a true understanding of Joe Pesci's youth, one can look no further than the Broadway show and Clint Eastwood musical, Jersey Boys, as the film tells the story of how Frankie Valli and Tommy DeVito formed the Four Seasons, with a little help along the way from a young, fast-talking kid named Joe Pesci. Yeah, this Joe Pesci. Tommy, the kid's a genius. You're gonna thank me for this. And don't forget, I discovered him. Yeah, that Joe Pesci, the film actor, who knows? In 1968, he would release his first solo album under the name Joe Ritchie called Little Joe Sure Can Sing, which he would sing covers of the pop hits of the time. And from there, at the ripe old age of 37, Joe Pesci would appear in his first film, The Death Collector in 1976, which has been renamed Family Enforcer. The film was not a massive success and hardly anyone saw it, but Robert De Niro saw it, and that's all that mattered, because Joe Pesci's performance impressed him so much that he had to convince Martin Scorsese to cast this guy in their next film, Raging Bull, in 1980. Come on. Fuck around, man. Come on. Hey, girl. I'm gonna smack you again. Throw it again. It's enough. So yeah, Joe Pesci's second film was Raging Bull, one of the greatest films of all time. Alongside Robert De Niro giving one of the greatest performances of all time, and Joe Pesci's there holding his own. And this is one of those characters that only Joe Pesci could have done. And of course, Joe Pesci earned his first Academy Award nomination. And we all know Robert De Niro is one of those method actors. And when De Niro flings Joe Pesci through the door and proceeds to stomp on him, well, De Niro, he actually broke one of Joe Pesci's ribs. I don't know, Robert, why couldn't you just, uh, you know, act? Put your hands up. What the fuck is so hard about that? Hey, Joe, well, you don't understand. So Joe Pesci was in an amazing film, and what did he do next? Well, he followed it up with two mediocre films. I'm Dancing As Fast As I Can, and Dear Mr. Wonderful. The next year he would appear in Eureka. Then he would finally get to show the world his funny side, alongside Rodney Dangerfield, in the movie Easy Money, which opened first place at the box office, 
Then in the year 1984, we would see Joe Pesci re-team with Robert De Niro in another masterpiece of cinema, this one brought to you by Sergio Leone. It was the epic Once Upon a Time in America. And then he would take a stab at network TV by appearing in a short-lived NBC series called Half Nelson, which was canceled after nine episodes. Then there was the original Man on Fire, which Denzel and Tony Scott would remake, and he would appear in that Michael Jackson moonwalker thing. I want every kid in this whole world to take drugs because of me. Because of me. I want everybody to know. Everybody. But then came Lethal Weapon 2, and Joe Pesci brought us one of the greatest comic relief characters ever put on screen. Leo. Of course, Lethal Weapon 2 went on to crush it at the box office, pulling in over $227 million off a $30 million budget, making it the third highest grossing film of 1989. And you guys are supposed to take care of me! Shut up! And if 1989 was the year that made Joe Pesci a star, well, the year 1990 made Joe Pesci a legend. First, he was in something called Betsy's Wedding, but then came Goodfellas, a film that to this day is still considered not just the greatest gangster film ever made, but one of the greatest films ever made of all time, ever in the history of all time. Joe Pesci said that a lot of the script came about while rehearsing the film, when the director, Martin Scorsese, would allow the actors to improvise. And that improv led to one of the most famous scenes in film history. Pesci, having grown up in New Jersey and being no stranger to working around real-life mobsters, was waiting on a table of real-life wise guys. And young Joe Pesci thought he would compliment one of them by telling him how funny he was. And this did not go over well with the made man. So that true life experience from Joe's past led to creating one of the finest moments of cinema ever. Get the fuck out of here, Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> you motherfucker! I almost had him! I almost had him! Goodfellas, of course, would be nominated for six Academy Awards, but only winning one. And that one went to Joe Pesci for his maniacal supporting turn as this crazy, crazy mobster. And of course, in true Joe Pesci fashion, when his name was announced, he walked up on that stage and gave one of the shortest Oscar acceptance speeches ever. Well, it's my privilege, thank you. Of course, Joe Pesci would finish off that year, 1990, very strong, by changing it up a little bit. Instead of playing a murderous wise guy with a thirst for violence, he would play a robber with a thirst for violence. But this time, there's children involved. In the Christmas classic Home Alone. <laughs> of course, Joe Pesci had a very difficult time not swearing in the movie, because swearing, it's like, it's like a fing thing, which resulted in the now infamous gibberish cursing that Joe Pesci perfectly delivers throughout the film. It's profanity that's fun for the whole family. And instead of the F word, they would try to say fridge instead. What the fridge? Joe Pesci absolutely loved the script for Home Alone, and he was very excited to do some family-friendly content for once. At over $476 million worldwide, this movie right here, Home Alone, remains Joe Pesci's highest grossing film ever. And Joe Pesci has said that this is one of, if not his favorite, of all the roles he's ever played. So much so that recently, he appeared in a Google Assistant commercial reacting to the Macaulay Culkin Google Assistant commercial. And it's, it's freaking glorious. <laughs> you nailed it. I nailed it, Joe. You nailed it. I nailed it. I did. I nailed it. Right after winning his Oscar, of course, he did a box office flop called The Super, but would quickly join the amazing ensemble cast of Oliver Stone's JFK in one of the most controversial films ever made, which also made a lot of money. 200 million at the box office, actually. This is too fucking big for you, you know that? This is who did the president? Who killed Ken? Fuck, man! 1992 would be a pretty solid year for Joe Pesci. It would start off with My Cousin Vinny, where he would play Cousin Vinny, 
My Cousin Vinny would be a solid hit for Joe Pesci with $64 million off an $11 million budget, and the critics loved it, calling it a sharp and hilarious courtroom comedy. And he would kinda do a sequel to My Cousin Vinny in the form of music. That's right, Joe Pesci would reprise his character from My Cousin Vinny in the 1998 album titled Vincent LaGuardia Gambini Sings Just For You, where his character from My Cousin Vinny sings just for you. Then he would go and do the lethal weapon thing again, appearing in number three, and for some reason his character Leo was not featured in the original draft of the script, but director Richard Donner quickly fixed that and added in the fan favorite character. The film would go on to be the highest grossing entry in the Lethal Weapon franchise, pulling in a worldwide total of $321.7 million. And yeah, Lethal Weapon 3, it's great because it's a Lethal Weapon movie. And yeah, it's like Mel Gibson and Danny Glover, they're perfect together. You don't want to mess that up, but add Joe Pesci, sure, yeah. Hey, hey, yeah. we're back. We're back! Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Hey, listen, listen. Yeah. You think I could get a gun this time? No! Joe Pesci would then do his thing on an episode of Tales from the Crypt and release another box office flop called The Public Eye, followed by hosting Saturday Night Live. And he had the dubious honor of hosting the show just one week after Sinead O'Connor tore up the Pope. Well, picture of the Pope. I mean, stuff like this is bound to happen if he keeps forgiving people. I tell you, somebody takes a shot at me, I don't forgive him so easy. But hey, I'm not like the Pope, I'm Italian. <laughs> And then they just had to do a sequel to Home Alone. So they did. So Joe Pesci brought us another Christmas classic, Home Alone 2 Lost in New York. And of course, Home Alone 2 would also make a ton of that money stuff, pulling in an impressive 359 million at that box office. Then Pesci's old pal Robert De Niro would call him back for De Niro's directorial debut, A Bronx Tale. And of course, those critics, they love Joe Pesci's acting. This would be followed by two underperforming films, the Barry Livingston film Jimmy Hollywood, and With Honors, where he played a homeless person opposite Brendan Fraser. You know how strong I am as an actor, I'm bound to be recognized. But then he would get back to his bread and butter, working with Martin Scorsese and Bobby De Niro once again for the phenomenal film Casino in 1995. And this casino would pull in $116 million worldwide. And of course, critics loved this return to organized crime, even though it wasn't considered as good as Goodfellas. But I mean, like, what is? But of course, this picture delivers pitch perfect performances. You shit kicking stinky horseman horse smelling motherfucker, you! By this time, Joe Pesci had become so iconic that parody followed with hilarious Saturday Night Live sketches called The Joe Pesci Show. And spoofing this wise guy truly made him a legend. See, first thing you have to do is you take the bat and you hit him in the knees. <laughs> then you hit him in the head. You understand what I'm talking about? Yes, yes, yes. But the year 1997 seems to be where things kind of went off the rails for Joe. He would start the year off with the box office bomb, Eight Heads in a Duffel Bag. Entertainment Weekly gave this one an F. And Entertainment Weekly is right about everything, you guys. He would then follow that up by reuniting with Danny Glover in Gone Fishing, another box office bomb. The film was originally meant for John Candy and Rick Moranis, and it probably would have been much better with them. In 1998, he turned down the opportunity to voice Mushu, the dragon, in Mulan, which is really hard to imagine. Your fucking warrant don't ever go over my fucking head again, you motherfucker, you. So instead of entering the animated world of Disney, Pesci would return as Leo in the fourth and probably final installment to the Lethal Weapon franchise. 
Lethal Weapon 4. And even though Joe Pesci has always been the comic relief in these movies, I have to admit that the scene with him and Riggs at his wife's grave, it'll make you tear up every time. Which goes to illustrate the genius that is Joe Pesci, with how he can nail the comedy and the heart in a single character at the drop of a hat. A true artiste. Of course, those people at the Razzies, they would disagree with me, and they nominated Joe Pesci for Worst Supporting Actor. Yikes. But Lethal Weapon 4 would go on to make $285 million worldwide. But yeah, this is a pretty good Lethal Weapon movie. It's like, it's like the fourth best one. It was at this point that Joe Pesci announced that he was officially retiring from acting. He wanted to get back to his music career. So, Joe Pesci released a rap album. Gangster rap. Yes, I, I'm gonna repeat that. Joe Pesci released a rap album. And yeah, this seems like something straight out of that Joaquin Phoenix mockumentary. It's a bitch that it gets you. And there was also his, you know, personal life. Even though Joe Pesci was staying away from making those gangster movies, that gangster life entered his reality in an almost life-imitating art sort of way, kinda, but not really. The husband of his ex-wife was shot, and a witness heavily implied that Joe Pesci paid for the hit. But all that turned out to be bullshit, apparently, and he was found innocent of a murder-for-hire plot. Years later, it came to life that Joe's ex-wife had actually hired the hitman. So Joe Pesci, thanks for being innocent and leaving all that gangster stuff on the screen. So yeah, he managed to stay away from the movie industry for a while. We went through a long, long Joe Pesci drought. But eventually, when your old pal comes a calling, you agree to do a cameo. And that's what Joe Pesci did in 2006 when he would return to the screen in the movie The Good Shepherd, directed by Robert De Niro. Then another four years would pass where we wouldn't get anything from Joe Pesci. But then came the year 2010 and he would appear in Love Ranch where we would get almost too much from him. And that same year he sued the production company that was making that movie Gotti. And Joe Pesci was going to play a strong supporting character in that. And he even began preparing for the role, putting on 30 f***ing pounds. But when the script was rewritten, the role was severely reduced resulting in the producers offering him a much smaller salary. So he sued him for three million, and it was settled out of court. And I guess Joe Pesci truly won that case because he didn't have to appear in that god-awful Gotti movie. So yeah, it would be nine years before we saw Joe Pesci back in those talkies. Only this time, it took some convincing. Better watch, there's a lot of tough guys around here. Did he tell you? <laughs> You're not afraid of tough guys, are you? I didn't think so. Netflix's The Irishman was a film that Martin Scorsese had been dying to make for years and years and years, decades. But no studio would back the project. Finally, in 2017, Netflix really wanted to get some prestigious stuff on their queue and get some of that Oscar attention. So they coughed up the 140 million that Martin needed to make this movie. And there's actually some unconfirmed reports that this actually cost over 250 million because of all those de-aging effects that just look perfect. And of course, they had no one else in mind to play this role than Joe Pesci. And Scorsese and De Niro, they thought that it would be easy to pull this guy out of retirement. But Joe Pesci was not interested in doing, quote, the gangster thing again. And he turned down the role a reported 50 times. But eventually, I guess they got him a Snickers and he caved. Don't forget who the fuck he owes. He knows who the fuck he owes. And Netflix said that over 64 million households watched this film in the first month of its release, making it one of their most watched original films ever. Except for Bird Box. To me, this seemed like an epic love it or hate it kind of masterpiece. Same with the de-aging CGI. It either worked perfectly for you, or it was massively distracting and ruined the whole film. It's not my favorite, and it does have its flaws, but I am happy that The Irishman exists. 
proving that the Goodfellas, they still got it. Of course, the Irishman would be nominated for, and lose, 10 Academy Awards, including a nomination for good old Joe Pesci, who in true Joe Pesci fashion didn't even bother to show up to the award show. Cause he had some fucking other things to do. Only three people in the world have one of these, and only one of them is Irish. And if you think that Joe Pesci was slowing down in the world of music, well, you'd be wrong. Because in the recent year of 2019, he released an album titled Pesci, Still Singing, returning to his first true love, music. And it's so great to see an artist do what they love. And good old Joe's filmography may be a little short, but when a good chunk of your resume includes some of the greatest films ever made all time in the history of time ever in history, it's hard to find the motivation to keep going. I mean, the guy conquered Hollywood like right away, allowing him to just focus on the projects that he wants to do. Making good movies is kind of a curse because I'm sure Joe Pesci was like, ah, fuck, how am I going to top Raging Bull and Goodfellas? Ah, fuck, it's all downhill from here. Or even fucking casino, fuck! Hey, Gus, he tried to kill us. Hey, he embarrassed me, Gus. I don't know about you, but he made me cry. I don't feel much like a man, Gus. The Irishman was a great try. And I am so grateful that it was made. But honestly, it wasn't exactly necessary for his legacy. And if he never, ever, ever appears in another single frame of film again, that's fine. He has given us plenty. So nobody should give a fuck about what the fuck happened to Joe Pesci. Oops. So thank you, Mr. Pesci, for all the great performances in all of the great films. And I truly hope that you're enjoying your retirement. You deserve it. Trust me, you have done enough for the art of cinema. No more is needed. But it would be nice to get a new rap album. Thank you for watching our show. If you like what you see, please subscribe to our Joe Blow Videos channel. Tell your friends who like this sort of content and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest videos. We're an independent company and we appreciate all your support.